slightly distorted quote. The Old Testament quotes were reissued in the first century by both Jews and Christians in changed form. So they would say what they wanted them to say. Let's look back at chapter 40 in Isaiah. And you will find how Mark changes the punctuation to say what he wants to say. Chapter 40, the, the, the context is that Israel has been captive in Babylon for some 50 years, and now Cyrus, the Persian king, has conquered the Babylonians and is allowing the Jews to go home to Jerusalem. Chapter 40 of Isaiah, verse 1. And it's very beautiful. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Comfort, because you're now going home to Jerusalem. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. The sins which got them exiled to Babylon for 50 years are pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Punishment is over. Now you can go home to Jerusalem, rebuild your temple, have your own rulers, etc., etc. Didn't turn out to be all of that, but they did go home and build the temple again. And it says, to announce this redemptive event, a voice cries, what voice? An angelic voice? A divine voice? The voice of history? We don't know. An anonymous voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Well, if Obama can sing, I can sing. So, the Jews are about to go home. And the writer here, with his brilliant imagination, sees a highway through the desert from Babylon back to Israel. And on it, the redeemed exiles are going to come, with God the Good Shepherd walking before them. They are sheep, and he carries the weak ones in his arms. What an image on the highway through the desert. So the voice cries, prepare a highway, a way in the desert. But what did Mark do with it? He says, a voice cries, and he gets rid of the punctuation, a voice cries in the wilderness. Not a voice cries something about a highway in the wilderness. He puts the voice in the wilderness because he says this is fulfilled in John the Baptist who lived in the wilderness. So he just erases the punctuation and he puts it the way he wants to. Of course, there was no punctuation in ancient Hebrew. So he just rereads it, not to mean what it originally meant, but to mean what he wants it to mean. Okay, fine, it's in the public domain, you can do that. So he puts the voice in the wilderness and ignores and, and talks about the, the way of the Lord, but it's not a highway, really. The way of the Lord is the way of Jesus. A voice crying in the wilderness. And now to illustrate who the voice crying in the wilderness belongs to, verse 4. We go from an Old Testament prophecy to its fulfillment. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, ah, the voice in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And there went out to him all the country of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. The world's about to end. You want to enter the new heaven and new earth? cleansed of sin. So come and wash your sins away. Now John was clothed with camel's hair. Well, a camel's hair coat today is a very expensive item, but this was more primitive. Kill a camel, take a skin, make a coat. And had a leather girdle about his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Well, it probably mean locust plants, which are edible. They taste sort of like collards or fiddlehead ferns. But it's possible, it is possible that he did eat locusts. I've eaten chocolate-covered ants and fried ants. 
on a bet, I wouldn't again. They're crunchy, tasty. Monkeys like them, a lot of protein. But insects are forbidden by the kosher laws, but grasshoppers are allowed. And if that's what he's referring to, you can eat grasshoppers. And maybe he did. I think it's probably the locust plant, but it's possible. Like the voice of, you know, the, the winter is over and gone, says the psalm, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. So people have been making little pictures of singing turtles ever since. But it means the turtle dove, of course. And he preached, saying, so he lives, after all, Israel is the land of milk and honey. He's eating messianic food, because elsewhere the Messiah will eat milk and honey, the symbols of the Holy Land. And, he pre and there are people who thought he was the Messiah. The Mandeans, they still exist in Iraq. John the Baptist, they say, was the Messiah. But in Christianity, he's the forerunner. He had a movement, Jesus had a movement. Does Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, which suggests John the Baptist's superior authority, he's baptizing Jesus. And so the text must make clear he's only the forerunner. In Matthew, he's very, Matthew, when he retells this story, is very disturbed that John the Baptist seems to be superior to Jesus and Jesus submits to his baptism. So in John the Baptist, he, in, in Matthew's version, he adds something. John sees Jesus. He knows who he is. In Mark, he doesn't know who he is. Just another guy. But in Matthew, he sees him and he knows he's the Redeemer and, he's, and he says, you should be baptizing me, Jesus, not I, you. That like, takes care of who's the superior. And Jesus says, no, I give you permission to do it. So that's how Matthew deals with it. In Luke, he's so disturbed over the image of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus and maybe someone will think he's the superior to Jesus. He leaves the scene out entirely. He has John the Baptist arrested before Jesus goes to baptism. And apparently someone else baptizes Jesus, not John the Baptist, someone anonymous. Luke, if he doesn't like a scene, he will change it. Matthew will add something, but never subtract to the text he gets from Mark. Both Luke and Matthew get their text from Mark, and they both add a lot. But only Luke will also delete Matthew hardly ever deletes because Jews have such a reverence for the written word. It's a sacred thing. You drop a Bible and you kiss it. When you take up your prayer book out of the pew in the synagogue, you kiss it. When you're finished with it, you kiss it. It's a holy, the words are holy things. And you don't delete an inherited text. But Luke was a Gentile. He didn't have any of those... Uh, phobias about deleting things. So he doesn't like John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, so he leaves it out. He puts John in prison before the baptism. So who, who baptized Jesus? Well, everyone knows John the Baptist, not in Luke. And in John, he leaves it out too. The Gospel of John says he didn't baptize Jesus. He pointed to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who taketh away the sins of the world. And you see many medieval paintings with John the Baptist pointing a bony finger at Jesus. That shows us who the superior is. So Mark just gives us a scene, but it could be misconstrued, so the later gospel writers alter it. And he preached, saying, the way, this is known as the theme of the subordination of John. And the Christians, remember, you had two messianic movements. Well, you probably had many. But the two we know about in the New Testament was the John movement and the Jesus movement. And it may be that by submitting to John's baptism, it indicates that Jesus was a member of John's movement originally. And then when John was arrested, he broke off from it and started his own movement. Because their message is identical. One synoptic gospel says the message of John the Baptist is the kingdom of God is at hand. The other synoptic gospel says the message of Jesus is the kingdom of God is at hand. It's no doubt the essence of Jesus' teaching, whatever he means by it. I said it could be the apocalyptic kingdom, it could be the historical kingdom, it could be the realized kingdom. 
The kingdom of God already in our midst, realized eschatology. The kingdom of God coming with catastrophic uh, natural disasters, apocalyptic eschatology. The kingdom of God coming just a new age of perfected history, the historical eschatology. It's all eschatology, stuff about the end of the world, but which of the three did Jesus mean? Probably one and two. Probably realized eschatology in the church, the kingdom of God's already here, but it will come upon the world in glorious technical error with disasters and catastrophes, and then you will see the Son of Man coming in glory. That's the apocalyptic kingdom, and he believed in that too. Now, John the Baptist was also an apocalyptic preacher. He believed the world was going to end and God would intervene, with or without a Messiah, we're not sure, but probably with a Messiah figure. Some of the prophets said God would intervene to perfect history on his own. Others say he would send a Messiah. So this is what John, this is the subordination of John in terms of what he says in Mark. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. A greater baptism is coming when the Spirit of God will enter humanity and we will have a spiritual rebirth. And of course that has happened in the whole spread of the Israelite faith throughout the world through Christianity. People feel the indwelling of the Spirit. And that's what Jesus brought, to break open the covenant, hence the title of my book, Opening the Covenant, to include the whole world. All right. So first we have the Old Testament prophecy, the voice crying in the wilderness. Then in verse 4, John the baptizer appeared to fulfill it. Then John prophesies. And now in verse 9, Jesus appears to fulfill that current prophecy. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Look how skillfully Mark takes us from a proclamation. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then quietly, in those days, came Jesus of Nazareth, and the reader says, ah, that's the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. In those days came Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And something extraordinary happens. Is he there to wash away sin? Yes. Now, Christians today would say Jesus was sinless, but Mark didn't think so. He thought he was an ordinary guy until his anointing. And when he came up out of the water, something extraordinary happened. Immediately he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. It doesn't say a physical dove. It does in Luke. In Luke it's a physical dove. Luke literalizes everything. In Luke, Jesus in Gethsemane sheds tears of sweat, uh, beads of, of blood, not sweat. He literalizes all kinds of things. In Luke, John the Baptist and Jesus are literal cousins, not here. And he literalizes the dove. An actual dove comes down. But here it just says like a dove, meaning, meaning gently. But also, Jesus is the only one who sees it here. In Matthew and Luke, everyone sees it. Only Jesus discerns the spirit and the voice. He, he saw the heavens open. In Matthew it says the heavens opened. It just happened, everyone saw it. He saw it in a vision. And the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. The Spirit of God enters Jesus at this point. And he becomes a new man. He becomes the Son of God. He's been anointed by John the Baptist. It's not just for the remission of sin. It's that water is equivalent to the oil that the high priest throws puts on the forehead of the Davidic king. He's the anointed one now. Wasn't born that way, but now he is. Jo uh, Mark, I believe, is an adoptionist. He said Jesus was adopted at the moment of his baptism slash coronation slash anointing. And now he's the king of Israel. But also a divinized man. The Holy Spirit has entered him. Now the Holy Spirit has entered a lot of people in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, before there were even many people. And God breathed into Adam's nostril the spirit of life. 
and man became a living being, a living soul. It's God's outreach into the world. That's what the Holy Spirit is. When God acts among us, he guides the church, enters our life, enriches us when we pray, if we're very lucky, and we're on the same wavelength as God, you can feel the presence of the Spirit. Moses was told, choose Joshua to succeed you, ish asher ruach bo, a man in whom is the Spirit. All the judges in the Old Testament, book of Judges, got the Spirit and became great generals. The prophets got the Spirit and they became great spokesmen for God. Ordinary guys, farmers and herdsmen, suddenly they're speaking the Word of God. So the Spirit can give many gifts. If they needed generals, it could give you military capacity. If they needed prophets, it could give you prophetic ability. Now the Spirit, the same Spirit, enters Jesus and will move him and motivate him and give him divine power for the rest of his life. Until on the cross, he says, I yield up the Spirit. And then the Spirit goes back to heaven, but it comes back at Pentecost and is bestowed on the whole church. And that's the age of the church we live in today, with the Spirit hopefully guiding our churches. A voice came from heaven, only Jesus apparently heard it, and what is it? It's the second psalm. Thou art my beloved son, with thee I am well pleased. So it's a quote from the second psalm, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So he's the king of Israel, but also a divinized man, with the Holy Spirit power in him. The Holy Spirit immediately moves him to go into the wilderness, into the desert. In America, wilderness would be a forest. There were no, well, in those days, it was, it was a desert. He goes into the desert, not far from where Moses and the children of Israel wandered. For 40 years, he's going to be there 40 days. Again, the parallel. In the Old Covenant, God has a problem, sin. He solves it, by creating the people Israel and giving them Torah, scripture, so that they can redeem the world. They can preach it to the world and bring the world back to God and solve the Garden of Eden problem. In the New Covenant, he sends not the people Israel, but a single Israelite to redeem the world and to preach to the world and bring it back to God and solve the problem of sin and to suffer and die to do that. Israel suffers and dies over and over again, up through until, including the Second World War, the murder of one-third of the Jews of the world, and then the persecutions by the communists. So Israel is crucified and resurrected over and over. In 19, I am fascinated by this parallel. Jesus Christ went into the tomb on a Friday. Three days later, he rose. Israel went into the tomb in 1945 at Auschwitz and was counted out, the Jews are finished. Three years later, all their prayers of 2,000 years were fulfilled to everyone's astonishment. The nation of Israel was reborn from the ashes of Auschwitz. The, now, when Jesus' life parallels the life of ancient Israel, well, that shouldn't surprise us. That's how the New Testament is written. 40 years, 40 days, 12 tribes, 12 apostles. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, the Spirit descends. The apostles go up to the upper room and the Spirit descends. Parallel after parallel after parallel. But when the history of Israel in the modern age reflects the story of Christ, of death and resurrection, after three days, three years, then my mind is blown. There's something going on here some glorious plan of God and paralleling between Christianity and Judaism, both faiths which are of God. I find it extraordinary. But people don't like to notice it because everyone thinks their own little church or synagogue is the way. And they don't say, well, let's take a look at how Christianity says it, how Judaism says it, and how they enrich each other. Yes, ma'am.
Because that, well, that's his Hebrew name. Jesus is obviously not Hebrew. Yeshua is the name of Jesus. Joshua, Yehoshua, which is in the time of, in Hebrew, it's Yehoshua. At this time, they spoke Aramaic, which is a cousin of Hebrew, and the name is Yeshua. That's his name. Hebrew and Jewish? Same thing. A, 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 well, originally, no, no it's, it's before. Originally, Abraham was a member of the Habiru class, H-A-B-I-R-U, meaning a, a wanderer, not in the deep desert, but on the periphery of society. Not a camel nomad, but a donkey nomad. The Habiru were not a race of people, but a class of people. And Abraham became known as a Hebrew. Then, with his grandson Jacob, who wrestled with God, another man, an angel, we don't know, but when he was wrestling with this other person in this incredible moment of religious struggle, the others said, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, you will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have contended with God and man. Meaning, Israel in Hebrew is Yisrael, meaning God wrestler. A one who wrestles with the ultimate questions of life, who wrestles with the question of the meaning of life. An awful lot of people are so distracted by running errands and keeping appointments, they never think about the meaning of life. But we're here because we do. That's what religion is all about, dealing with the meaning. The f Look, we are human beings, limited in every way, finite, but we yearn for the infinite, an infinite meaning. It's not enough just to have our family and our town and our country. We want to connect to the infinite life of the universe, which is God. And that's to be an Israelite, whether we're a Jew or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever. A God wrestler. So that's what that means. But the people who were called Hebrews at the time of Jacob became known as Israelites, God wrestlers. And then they were divided after a period of three monarchs, they, uh, Saul in 1020 BC, David in 1000 BC, and Solomon in 960 BC, uh, there was the United Nation of Israel. But then when Solomon died in 920 BC, the nation split in half. And in the north you had Israel, and in the south you had Judah. And those who lived in the south called themselves Judeans. And that morphed into Jews. So Jesus was a Jew religiously, but he was from the north, a Galilean. So somebody might prefer to call him an Israelite. But nowadays it means the same thing. Hebrew, Israelite, Jew, it came in three different periods in history. But today, the, the organization of Reformed Synagogues was called the Organization of, of the United Hebrew Congregations. They've now changed it to the Organization of Reformed Jewish Synagogues. But there's no difference today. A Jew will probably call himself Jewish, but some people will say you're an Israelite or a Hebrew. It doesn't matter. So today they're interchangeable, but they developed at different times, all right? Same people, different titles. All right. The Spirit is now in him, and from within him it drives him out into the wilderness. Where Moses spent 40 years, he spends 40 days. And he was in the wilderness 40 days. That's the parallel. It's crucial. What the Jews accomplished in the Old Covenant, Christ will accomplish in the New. And he was tempted by Satan. Here he is on the same level as Satan, the malevolent power that is arrayed against God, a supernatural, if you will, power. We don't know who Satan is at the point, this point, except that they believed, the Jews believed at that time, that the world was divided between God and his angels and Satan and his demons. And that all kinds of legends accrued that he, Satan was a fallen angel and he rebelled against God. That comes, I don't know whether that was in place at this point. But Satan is trying to screw up God's creation. And if he can get the Redeemer to abandon his task 
all the good for Satan. He wants us all to die in our sins and not be redeemed. He was in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan, but it doesn't say how t Satan tempted him. For that, we have to look at the other Gospels, which expand on this fascinating scene. But he's on an equal level with Satan, so he is of a supernatural, I hate to use that term, but a divine, a divine quality. And he was with the wild beasts. They didn't hurt him. They seemed to recognize him. Satan knows him, and the beasts know him, and the demons will know him, but people won't know him. And the angels ministered to him. That doesn't happen with most ordinary people. Well, the angels ministered to Elijah, who was a prophet, but he went to heaven in a fiery, in a whirlwind attended by a fiery chariot. So Elijah and Jesus have a lot in common. But it seems to suggest a supernatural identity. I keep saying that, a divine identity. This is no ordinary man. He is a man, but he's more than man. The angels minister to him. The good guys are on his side, Satan and the demons on the other side. Now, after John was arrested, John is arrested by King, wicked King Herod Antipas, Jesus came into Galilee. So was Jesus a, a member of the apocalyptic movement of John the Baptist? Some of whose followers thought he was the Messiah? Or when John is arrested, does he then break with that movement and found his own? Well, both could be so. Only after John is arrested does he begin his ministry. So there's some connection there. You know, it's like when my father died, I, I looked up two ancient uncles, one in Abbeville, South Carolina, one in Baltimore. It never occurred to me to do it till my dad died. I wanted the substitute father. And I found in both of them wonderful old men and we bonded deeply until they passed. But Jesus didn't act on his own as a preacher and teacher and healer until John was arrested. And he continues his mission. Jesus came into Galilee. He's a Yankee Jew. He's in the north. <laughs> preaching the gospel of God, saying, so the kingdom of God is at hand. Now in Matthew, it's John the Baptist who uses exactly the same phrase. So their ministries are very closely connected. The kingdom of God is at hand. Whatever else Jesus taught or didn't teach, that phrase is the essence of of the preachment of Jesus Christ. Not, I'm the Messiah. He doesn't go from town to town saying who he is. He doesn't say that until his hearing before the high priest. And even then, all accounts don't say he said that. Are you the Messiah or not? You say that I am. But in another gospel, he says, I am. So, but that was at the very end. His identity is not the essence of his preaching. What's happened since then is the medium has become the message. What Christians ask is, what think ye of the Christ? That's the great question. Do you accept Jesus? That wasn't the question for Jesus. It was, are you ready to enter the kingdom of God? It's at hand. Although interestingly enough, in the synoptic gospels, Jesus never baptizes anybody. He was baptized, but somehow he doesn't think that it's necessary. Only in the Gospel of John, at one point, Jesus baptizes somebody. But not in the Synoptic Gospels, which are much more accurate. Why not? I don't know. If baptizing was a way of entering Israel, and Jesus produced, remember, it's not just casting off sin, but entering the church. Now you're marked as Christ's own, they say at the font. It's entering, the has a double meaning, getting rid of sin and entering the church. What was the church then? It was the Jews. So if Jesus preached exclusively to Jews, with two exceptions in Matthew, the Syrophoenician woman and the Gerasene demoniac, the others are all Jews. Why would you baptize them if baptizing is an entry into the people of God? They already were in the people of God. It's Gentiles who have to be baptized. You all in this church and others have to be, I wasn't baptized. I was born of a Jewish mother and all those fluids that came out of her when I was born, that's my baptism. I'm a Jew because my mother's a Jew. But that's not true in Christianity. Your parents can be pious Christians and you're not born a Christian. You have to be reborn a Christian. 
Baptism is a virtual birth ceremony. So that's why Jesus didn't baptize people. He was preaching to Jews who didn't need it. I don't think we need it now because Christians need it because you're not born a Christian, but Jews are born Jews. You enter the covenant through baptism. I enter the covenant through being born. Same covenant, two sides. All right, but then why didn't he baptize people for the remission of sin as John did? I, I can't answer that question, but he didn't. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. But it's not a repentance that, as far as Jesus is concerned, requires baptism. Believe this good news. Be prepared for the kingdom of God and repent your sins. Verse 16. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brothers, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. How beautiful. He starts to choose the first four of his disciples right away. He needs them to be his students and to follow him and spread the message. Fishermen. And immediately they left their nets and followed. What's the theme? The absolute authority of God. Two young men, been fishers all their lives, they drop everything. They leave the nets and follow this man they never saw before because they see in him something wonderful, marvelous. And they drop everything, the th absolute authority of Jesus. We saw his authority to repel Satan and now to call his followers. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat. Well, boys, where are you going? Oh, we don't know exactly, but where are we going? They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. He will preach with authority and shock everybody by the authority that he evinces and exhibits. Verse 21, they went into Capernaum, I've been there, and I've been at that synagogue. What a thrill to sit in the fallen stones of that beautiful little stone synagogue and read this text. And as I was sitting there, suddenly my head got wet. A little Italian monk had crawled up behind me and anointed me with holy oil. And he, I said, what is happening? He said, this will never hurt you. <laughs> and it didn't. But that's what you have to do. Take your Bibles and go there and read the stories where they took place. In this little synagogue, a confrontation between the cosmic power of good and evil is about to take place. An extraordinary moment. Jesus' first miracle in Mark. In John, it's something else, but this is in Mark. They came into Capernaum, sort of the capital of that northern region, right by the sea. It's right near the Sea of Galilee. It's so beautiful. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue. Jesus was a synagogue goer. He couldn't stand the temple in Jerusalem and its rituals of animal sacrifice, but he won't go there, until, according to Mark, until his last week. But he's a synagogue goer. Luke says he went to synagogue on Saturday as his custom was. He entered the synagogue, and there he would have found the core of what he would find in an Orthodox synagogue today. Of course, we've expanded it to three hours because Judaism is endlessly repeating prayers and adding and adding, and it'll never take anything out. So you go to synagogue at nine in the morning and you're stuck there till noon. People who know know not to get there till 10. You know the ones who get there at nine? If there's a bar mitzvah, the Christian guests who don't know any better, it says, join us at 9 a.m. for the synagogue service. And those poor people, they have to sit for three hours at a Hebrew service not knowing a word that's going on until the boy gets up and makes his speech. But uh, the Jews know better. We get there at 10, that's good. Two hours is enough for anybody. And they went into Capernaum and he, uh, he goes on the Sabbath. He entered the synagogue and taught. So they invite him. That's not his native synagogue. He's from Nazareth, a tiny little spot. But now in Capernaum, a little bigger, they see a stranger. Now, I walk into a synagogue in Baltimore, in Washington, and they see a stranger. And they see I can read the prayers, and they'll say, Brother, would you like to read the prophetic lesson today? Would you like to come up and say a blessing? And so they do it with Jesus. 
and he gives a little sermon. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority. Again, the theme of this section is the authority of Christ, and not as the scribes. What do they mean? The scribes would preach in this way, and rabbis still do it. First of all, no rabbi can forgive sin. You want sins forgiven, you've got to go to God the Father and pray directly. A rabbi cannot say your sins are forgiven the way a priest can. And rabbis preach like this. Here we have a text. Well, rabbi so-and-so says it means this, and rabbi so-and-so says it means that, and the third rabbi says something else, and you have three interpretations. And often the rabbi will not give his own opinion. And if he does, it's just as, as an opinion. Rabbis don't generally preach with authority. Their preachments are rather humble and citing established texts. But Jesus preaches with authority. Not Rabbi Tarfon says this and Rabbi Akiva says that, but I say unto you, and this stunned people and shocked them. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not like the scribes and the rabbis. Now, it's not the sermon that's the main point here. Immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He has a demon in him, and he cried out. Who cried out? Not the man, it's in the voice of the man, but the spirit in him that's tormenting him cries out. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demon knows him, because he's on a divine level like the demon is on beyond the ordinary limits of, of nature. The people don't have any idea who Jesus is, just he preaches with authority, but the demon knows him. And here we have the first example of the messianic secret in Mark. Jesus rebuked the demons and said, <coughs> be silent. Don't tell anyone. I'm not ready. I don't want them to know. Perhaps if they knew, the Romans would come and arrest him. The Holy One of God, that's terrifying to the Roman occupiers. So he, shut up, demon. That's command number one. And the demons are silent because of the authority of Jesus. Not only over men, but over demons.